Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? Our first song is Christ Arose. We're just checking to see if anybody's awake. me as I'm preaching, I had to think when I was getting the messages from people that said, hey, I'm going to be there. Thank you for letting me know. I often wonder if sometimes maybe we come to church for other people, not just ourselves. Um, it, it strengthens me when I see my friends and my family and the church house full. Um, I think sometimes we can just come for ourselves, which is good, but it's, it's nice to have people that worship together with us. Are we living proof of the resurrection? God speaks to us in a lot of ways, and I don't preach often, but when I do, I, I want it to mean something, and I want it to be something that I feel very personal about. So I really try to look for it. I always try to seek God's word throughout my daily life, but I really look for it when I'm trying to preach. And this one was tough for me. I couldn't get a grasp on what he wanted me to share. Sometimes he keeps me up late at night, and then he gives me a word in the middle of the night, and oh, now I can go back to sleep. This time it was just in conversation with people, um, guys on the fire department, guys at work, uh, friends that I have. The same resounding idea kept popping up. So I had the idea and I had the scripture kind of nailed down, but I couldn't come up with a title. 
Every good sermon needs a good title. I'm, I'm driving on the toll road, and I don't even remember what the billboard said. I was coming back from a job site, but it asked a question. And just as soon as I, I read it, are we living proof of the resurrection popped in my head. I don't know how, I mean, I know how it happened. It wasn't me, it was God. I guess I bring that up to say that it strengthens me when I study for a sermon. The Bible promises us, if we seek, we will find. Uh, I know for myself, it's kind of easy to fall in the day-to-day routine of work and sleep and family and work and sleep and family. We kind of forget to to seek the Lord. Um, Our passage for this morning, if you want to turn in your Bibles, is Romans 8. We're here this morning celebrating the greatest sacrifice and the best miracle that happened ever. Romans 8 is one of the best chapters in my mind in the Bible to read. There's a bunch that mean a lot to me, but in studying this, it meant even more to me. We're going to read Romans 8, 1 to 17, and then we'll come back and, and recap it. So starting in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus, the law, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desires. But those who live in according with the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Let's pray. Dear Father, God, I ask the blessing on the reading of this word. Be with me in the mindfulness of my heart and the words that you give me to speak. Help me share what you have laid on my heart, Lord, in your name. Amen. So going back to verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I think I could just stop right here and pray and we can just go to breakfast and it just all be done with. I don't highlight a lot of things in my Bible. In fact, I don't think I have anything in this Bible. I don't, it kind of draws my eye away from verses that could pop out in my mind. But if I was to highlight or if you were a highlighter, this is one to highlight. Paul has spent the first seven chapters of Romans telling us how we are condemned. We're going to hell. We're sinful by nature. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And then he starts chapter 8, verse 1 here by saying, There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say there's almost no condemnation. It doesn't say we have to be perfect to have no condemnation. It just says for those in Christ Jesus... There's no condemnation. Moving on to verse 2. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
depending which version you're reading, the NIV will say because, and the King James Version says for, but regardless, either first word there is Paul backing up, or now verse 2, he's going to give proof for what he just said in verse 1. In the NIV, there's two words, law, there. You have the first one, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, and then at the end you have the law of the Spirit, or the law of sin and death. The first law isn't the law like we might be thinking of. It's not like the law of Moses. This would be to like a controlling power. I heard it explained when I was studying for this, and it really grabbed my mind. It made it easier to understand is like the law of gravity. So the Holy Spirit, like the law of gravity, controlling over our life. If I ever had to wonder if I have the Holy Spirit in my life, there has been times when I have been had to bite my tongue, and I know that I do not have that strength in me to bite my tongue. That would be the controlling power of the Holy Spirit. The things we immediately want to do, our fleshly desire wants to reach out and just grab that person, but the controlling power of the Holy Spirit can make us not. Paul's going to refer to the Holy Spirit a lot throughout this chapter, and that's pretty much what this chapter is about. As we move on to verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Does anybody know what the law was powerless to? What law is he referring to there? Does anybody know? It would be the law of Moses. So if you go back to Leviticus, it would be the third book in the Bible, there's 613 laws in there. And before Jesus came, the Jews used to live by those 613 laws. So when they'd sin, they'd have to give an animal sacrifice, and that would be back to what you think of like the sacrifice. They have to shed the blood of the animal to pay atonement or payment for their sins. I had to think as I was studying for this, I was like, I would need a big farm, and I think all of us would. There would be a lot of animals that would need to be shed. One note here at the beginning, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. Is the law of Moses bad? No. It's not bad at all. In fact, it's almost perfect. It gives us the exact way to live. It tells us what to do, what not to do. The law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. Our flesh. We're weak. We're the reason that the law doesn't work. God puts the law into place and then gives the law to us to do, but we can't do it. We're powerless to do it. As we move on here, I want to touch on this a little bit about the legalism and the works kind of ties in. I don't want to go down a huge rabbit hole here, but that can kind of tie into our lives today. We can kind of have these laws and rules that are put into place and we can say, well, if I follow these, then I'm going to be okay. But we can't do it. We're imperfect. Not the way that God intended us to live. As a young Christian, I know that you're, you're trying to do the best you can, and I remember this from my own life. And a lot of times I lived in constant fear of, of breaking a rule or, or not being perfect. And while that, that's true, we're not perfect and we'll never be perfect. It draws attention away from the life-saving grace and forgiveness of God by constantly trying to live in these laws and rules. It's hard to live in the fullness of God's love and forgiveness if we're constantly in fear of breaking a man-made rule. There's no works that can save us, only the life-giving blood and saving of Jesus Christ. In fact, if works, could if works could save us, it would take that power away from Jesus. Verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who did not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. This kind of ties back to that verse that I just went over. It's met in us, not by us. 
It's an important distinction. If it was met by us, that means that I could put my hands on it, like we so often like to do as humans, put my hands on it and I can fix it. I'm going to do it. This one can't be made by us. It's got to happen in us. It's kind of hard to understand, as I was trying to wrap my mind around it, how Jesus can just continue to save. We as humans would get tired of it eventually. Think if you were in charge of forgiving yourself. How tiring would it be? Constantly having to go, yes, yes, I forgive you. Would you just stop? It doesn't work, right? So I'm trying to wrap my mind around something of how, how I can tie this to a way that I can really wrap my head around. And God often uses my son to tie things to how he loves us. And instantly I thought of it, and instantly it made sense. In my feeble attempt to be a perfect father, if I can love my son unconditionally, it doesn't matter what he does, how he messes up, when he messes up, how often he messes up, I'll get upset, I'll get frustrated, but I will constantly love him. He has my DNA in him, making him my son, much like we can have the Holy Spirit of God in us, making us his son or daughter. Verses 5 to 7, I kind of want to read as a batch here. Often in the scriptures, when we find things repeated three times, it's of great importance. I tied that to like if we're on a job site and I go, hey, that's a lot different than going, hey, hey, hey. Whole different, you know, whole different idea there. This wasn't brought out in any commentaries that I read, but it was God brought it out in my mind where 5, 6, and 7 don't quite 100% repeat themselves, but that same idea is there behind it. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So that's kind of the idea. That's the first one. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. There it is again. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it it do so. And there it is again. The mind controls. We move on to verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ in you, Christ, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Verse nine is pretty straightforward here. There's really no dancing around it. There's really no, oh, I don't know if he really means this. If the spirit of Christ is not in you, you don't belong to Christ. End of story. How can Paul say this? It's pretty easy. We're born and saved by Christ. So if we aren't saved by Christ, we're not in Christ. There's no other way to be a Christian. Just like we talked about in verse 2. That power of Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Thinking of we have to have Christ in us to be sons and daughters of Christ. What if there was a random child sitting next to my son? Would sitting next to him be good enough to be a son of mine? No. Many people all over the country go to churches, though, believing that. If I do everything right, if I sit next to the right person, if I do what that guy's doing, I can be a Christian. It's not the way it works. Never has been, never will be. What is the only way that that child could be mine? Do I have an answer? Adoption. That's right. Verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Pretty straightforward here. Not much I want to bring out, but we know our earthly bodies will die. As it's often been said, there's two things certain in life, death and taxes. We know it's happening. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. 
our soul can live. Verse 11, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Being Easter weekend and studying for this, I've never actually read this verse and felt the power that I felt while I was studying for this sermon. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, that's pretty powerful. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Do we live like that? It's living in us. There we see it twice. Living in us and then because the spirit who lives in you brings it out twice. It's actually living. But is it living? A living tree brings forth fruit. Let that spirit live in us and show us the way to live. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. Obligation would be like a debt. We have a debt to pay. But it's not to the flesh. That debt's been paid. Jesus died for that debt. That blood has been shed for that debt. We don't have that debt anymore. It's hard sometimes to live and remember. We're forgiven. We know we're forgiven. But that guilt can stay with you. Constantly living that thing over and over and over in your mind. How did I mess that up? Why do I keep doing this? When we live in that obligation to the debt of the flesh, it's hard to live to the power of Christ. We're free. We need to live like it. Verse verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Just as a seed must die to bring forth fruit, we must put to death the misdeeds of the body to bring forth fruit for the Spirit. How can we put to death the misdeeds of the body? If we go back to verse 2, like we said, through the power of Christ frees us from the law of sin and death. That's the only way. The power of Christ. Again, this whole chapter has been referring to, we can't do it on our own. Very bottom end of that verse, you will live. Amen. Amen. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. It's almost too easy in that verse. We want to make it something that we can do, something that we can fix, something that we can put our hands on and I can do myself. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God, period. That's it. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Adoption, just like we talked about earlier. There's only one way that that child sitting next to Rhett could be mine. Through adoption. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. He's speaking of the law there. To live in fear of the law. Not being good enough. Never being good enough. Constantly having to live in that fear. The spirit of God didn't come to do that again. The very end of the verse we see, And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is a phrase only found three times in the Bible, and only two people spoke it, Jesus and Paul. It's one that's reverent, yet very, very intimate. One that's very personal. And that's the idea that I was wanting to bring out today, is personal. 
Throughout these conversations in these three weeks leading up to this, it just kept coming up. It has to be personal. Abba Father, it has to be personal. It has to be his life-saving blood on your life. There is no other way. There is no set of books or rules or laws that we can follow to be a son or daughter of Christ. There is none. We often try, but there is none. Jesus obviously had a special relationship to God, his son. Again, personal. When he says, Abba, Father, he, that was in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he was crucified. It's personal. And then Paul was the only other person that spoke that. What did Paul do before Paul was Paul? He was hell-bent on killing the sinners. He was going to do it. Rode to Damascus, changed his whole life. I believe he felt that personal. God yearns for us to be one with him. Do we yearn for the same? Verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. His Spirit testifies with our spirit. I had to think of the age-old thing where you got a little guy on this shoulder and a little guy on this shoulder, a good guy and bad guy. The Holy Spirit is testifying against my, with my flesh. Nope. We're all good. Yep, you're going to mess up. That's going to happen. Ask for forgiveness. The blood is shed. Payment's been paid. We move on. 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The Romans and Greeks, when they adopted a son or a daughter into their family, it was 100% in. There was no, well, I give my son this, and then my adopted son gets part of this. All in. They were 100% sons. So when Paul is writing this and he speaks of adoption, and then he speaks that we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, he's letting the Romans and all... Jews know we are co-heirs with Christ. We are equal with Christ. We will have co-heirs of God. If indeed we share in his sufferings, we will also share in his glory. In closing, I want to say that if you're a Christian and you're living with the Holy Spirit in your life, this chapter is a great one to come back on if we're ever having a tough time. We're ever struggling, wonder if we can ever do enough. We can't, but God can. He wants to be your loving father. Remember that, Abba Father. That personal. He wants to be your personal father. Again, I had to think of my son when I was studying for this. The relationship between a father and child is special. It's personal. Speak almost every day. See each other almost every day. Do we do that with God our Father? He yearns for each and every one of you to be a son or daughter. It's the biggest decision you'll ever make in your life. I'm going to close in prayer. And I want to do something that I haven't done before, but I want to do the sinner's prayer at the end. I felt called as I was studying this to, to say this. If by all means you want to come forward and give your life to God, now would be a perfect time to do it. But I know for myself before I did that, I didn't want to move. <laughs> I ain't standing up. If somebody else stands up, then I'll probably stand up. I want to make it as easy as possible. But I think that you should talk to somebody too. So if it's Jeff, if it's me, if it's Tad, if it's anybody here that you trust and love, reach out and talk to them. 
But we're going to close in prayer. And then, a, then I'm going to go through the sinner's prayer. And I'm going to say it nice and slow. And if you'd like to repeat that right where you sit, you do so. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we thank you for this another Sunday that you've given to us. We thank you for the death and resurrection of your son. We thank you for the bloodshed for our sins. To make it possible to be sons and daughters of you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the love that you show us and the love that you bestow on us every day and the blessings that you bestow on us. Now for the sinner's prayer. Dear Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, please?
All righty. We would like to invite each and every one of you to breakfast um, down in the basement following this service. And then we have our regular church service planned at 10 o'clock. So if you want to stick around for that, it would be good to see you. Let's uh, say a word of prayer remembering the food. Dear Lord, we again come to you thanking you for this time that you've blessed us with. We ask that you be with the food in the basement. Bless the hands that have prepared it, Lord. In your name, amen. You are dismissed.